good evening all indian medical college welcomes you all to this online class in today's session we have dr saumya batacharya professor and uh, head anatomy from asi pg imsr kolkata with us she is having plenty of teaching experience behind her she will be taking class on third and uh, lateral ventricle today good evening ma'am and welcome yeah good evening it's a great evening, pleasure sir. to have you here with us ma'am it's indeed an opportunity uh, dear to be viewers here yeah. yes please ma'am yeah uh, thank you uh, dear viewers and uh, professor balaji and your team uh, it's indeed an opportunity to be uh, able to engage myself in the indian medical college platform where i can reach out to multiple students of various medical colleges and uh, we can have an exchange of knowledge as well as uh, it's a big contribution in the field of anatomy as well as other disciplines of medicine uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity i would like to start my session excuse me ma'am dear viewers the live chat session is enabled along with this live stream if you have any doubts please type them in the chat section your queries will be clarified by her at the end of this session ma'am you can share your screen to start the presentation now thank you ma'am thank you so my dear students uh, we will have the session on the third and lateral ventricle as uh, many of you might have attended my earlier uh, class on the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle so uh, this is uh, uh, you can take it as a uh, as a consequence or a, as a next step forward so i am professor somya from joka kolkata and uh, as uh, we can take the next slide you can see this ventricular system which is uh, basically we can have the uh, lateral ventricle and the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle we have already discussed the fourth ventricle in the last class and uh, we will do the lateral and the third ventricle today so that we are done with the ventricular system now uh, the most important thing is the ventricular cavities when we see these ventricular cavities the basically if i see the earlier diagram you i show you this is the lateral ventricle and i'm sure my dear students you know that this is corpus callosum then we have this is the third ventricle and then we go to the brain stem which starts with the mid brain then pons and medulla and by the side we have the fourth ventricle so this comprises the ventricular system why do we need this ventricular system why do we need to learn this because we have the csf circulation through this ventricular system which is essential because if there is a blockage if there is an overaccumulation it leads to multiple uh, multiple ailments therefore when we uh, see this ventricular system we find that there are ventricular cavities now in this ventricular cavity the lateral ventricle so this is the lateral ventricle the diagram which is on your right low so you can see that 
this lateral ventricle opens into third ventricle. We have the pointer on the third ventricle. And this is the third ventricle. And then we have the in interventricular foramen of Monroe, which connects them. Then third ventricle again gets connected with the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. The fourth ventricle again communicates with the inferiorly with the central canal. So this entire ventricular system is lined by the ependymal cells. So this can itself come as an MCQ. That ventricular system is lined by a, ependymal cells, B, mesothelium, C, can be umbrella cells, D, can be podocytes. So where you label them as the ependymal cells. Like my earlier class, my dear students, I always tell you that you frame your own MCQs as you go on studying. Because there cannot be any MCQ other than what you have prepared. Now coming to the next slide, that is the third ventricle bronze. Now, what is this third ventricle? Now my pointer is on the third ventricle. So what is this third ventricle? This third ventricle is a part of the diencephalon. So this itself can come also as a MCQ. That third ventricle is a part of diencephalon, rhombencephalon, metencephalon, myelencephalon. Now, it is also filled with CSF and there can be, this is the thalamus which gets connected on either side because there are two thalami which, which are connected by the interthalamic adhesions connecting the two thalami. So these are the adhesive fibers. Now this third ventricle has a boundary of anterior one, posterior wall, two lateral walls, floor and roof. We will see one by one. You will ask me why and this third ventricle and lateral ventricle in my last class was fourth ventricle and cerebellum. Why do we need to know them by heart? As I started my class by saying that the CSF circulates and this CSF is essentially responsible for the, you know, the CSF has certain compositions which are essential. CSF has the pressure which also maintains the intracranial tension and we will see how this CSF, if it gets absorbed, what happens? If it doesn't get absorbed, what happens? If it is normally secreted, what happens? If it is over accumulated or over secreted, what happens? Since the CSF passes through these ventricles, therefore it is essential that we learn about each of these ventricles. Now coming to the anterior one. Now you have to see this arrow. There is an arrow, a blue arrow on the right hand side covering wide area. This is basically the anterior one. We start from the lamina terminalis. We start from lamina terminalis, which is where is it located? At the interventricular foramen of Bombo. And where do we stop? From lamina terminalis to supraoptic recess. So from here, supraoptic recess. And then we go to the anterior commissure, which is on the upper end of the lamina terminalis. And it reaches up to the diverging fibers of the forehead. So this on the right hand side, the whole arrow covers your anterior wall. <coughs> to be precise, it starts from lamina terminalis to supraoptic recess to the 
anterior commissure up to the diverging fibers of the cortex and at that point we get the vulva now this is vulva a triangular recess look at the contour of this this is triangle so this is a triangular recess which is between the anterior commissure the tip of it and the diverging fibers of the fornix the base of it so if i have to repeat because question comes as write the boundary or the write the structures which form the anterior wall of third ventricle so you will write the supraoptic recess then the lamina terminalis then the anterior commissure then the diverging fibers of the fornix the tip of which is known as vulva so this entire part is known as the anterior wall of the third ventricle i will take you to the next slide the next slide is the posterior wall now the posterior wall is basically from above downwards you get you see again an arrow on the left hand side so on the right hand side is your anterior wall on your left hand side is your posterior wall here you get the suprapineal recess then you get the pineal body then you get the pineal recess then you get the aqueduct uh, aqueduct of midbrain or the aqueduct of sylvius and posterior commissure and above is habenular commissure now my dear students i would ask you to make a note of it that it starts from the suprapineal recess then you get the habenular commissure then the pineal gland pineal body pineal recess then the posterior commissure and the aqueduct of sylvius so if we take the right hand diagram you can see the posterior wall all by yourself so you can see the posterior wall so out of which you have to remember since it starts from the suprapineal recess above so remember suprapineal recess remember the pineal body pineal recess remember the two commissures and the aqueduct of midbrain or aqueduct of sylvius now as i always mention if something is given chronologically try to remember chronologically now this is a diagram this diagram the left side diagram is a must practice diagram so you draw it for once label for the anterior one for the posterior one let us go to the next slide the next slide says that the pineal recess see the red one i have labeled it the other labelings are there but i have covered this so that i can draw your attention towards this this is nothing but the pineal recess it is triangular see above you get the habenular commissure and below you can get the and posterior commissure in between is the pineal recess so where does it extend to the pineal body so this is the pineal body so you can see the pineal body here you can see the pineal recess here you can see flanked by habenular commissure above and posterior commissure below therefore you can just pineal recess can come as an mcq following statements are true about pineal recess except extends into stock of pineal body flanked above by the habenular commissure below by the posterior commissure and laterally by the anterior commissure so your choice will be 
all the following are true except so there is no picture of anterior commissure here when we talk about the roof you can see a label here arrow arrow which is from below up this below up arrow blue in color now this arrow is starting from the ependymal lining so this crenated margin again black in color is the ependymal lining then the red crenation is the choroid flexures this is ventricle and then you get the tila choroidea so you get the tila choroidea and then of course you get the body of fordes so from the ependymal line, lining to the body of fordix is the extent of the roof of the third ventricle coming to the floor of third ventricle see there is another arrow down floor will obviously be the lower part so it is also formed by the optic chiasma Now, optic chiasma. If you have done the optic nerve, then you know that optic nerve they cross to form the optic chiasma. This optic chiasma is very important because section of the optic chiasma leads to many disorders, uh, and this is a very common condition. So this is optic chiasma. Then you get the tuber cinerium. Then the mammillary bodies, posterior perforated substance, and the tegmentum of midbrain. Tegmentum of midbrain. So, see on the right and most diagram, there is the brain stem. The first part is the midbrain, which is adjacent to the third ventricle. So you can see the there is the touch of midbrain. which is the tegmental part now if you see the right right and most diagram for each part of the third ventricle i have given the must know which are the structures which you cannot forget when you are writing on the third ventricle and if you can put these arrows and follow them then you are not making any mistake so optic chiasma then in fundibular recess tuber cinerium mammillary body and the tegmentum of the midbrain these are the structures which form the floor of the third ventricle coming to the lateral wall the lateral wall is there are two lateral walls now so two lateral walls if we draw a line that is the subthalamic or hypothalamic sulcus this white line is the hypothalamic or the subthalamic sulcus what does it do it divides it into a structure above or area above and area below the how do we draw this line we draw from the interventricular foramen of munro to the aqueduct of midbrain so this extent of hypothalamic or subthalamic sulcus from the interventricular foramen of munro to aqueduct of midbrain has two parts above large part which is the medial surface of the thalamus and below is the small part which is containing the nuclei of the hypothalamus and subthalamus hypothalamus you cannot forget here so the sulcus on the lateral wall the subthalamic or hypothalamic sulcus divides the lateral wall into two parts a part above look at this part this is the part above so the part above is the thalamus and the part below is the hypothalamus so this is the lateral now when we were discovering this knowledge of lateral wall 
we find that just adjacent to the lateral wall there is a double layered structure which is actually the pia mater and this is the tila choroidea this white space is known as the tila choroidea so this tila choroidea is basically it is a double layered pia mater you can see this fine lining of the pia mater between the splenium and the fornix so this you can see and you can see the fornix here so fornix and the splenium we get the pia mater which is triangular which is thin anteriorly and this is against the interventricular foramen posteriorly there is a gap wide gap which is known as transverse fissure see this is transverse fissure so you get a transverse fissure so this is tila choroidea so what is tila choroidea you can get again an mcq you can also get a short answer question on tila choroidea it is nothing but a double layered pia mater you can get it as the arachnoid matter pia mater endosteal dura mater or double layered dura mater where you have to take the double layered pia mater where is it located it is located on the adjacent to the lateral wall and has a triangular structure which is anteriorly against the interventricular foramen and posteriorly there is a transverse fissure now if we look at because tila choroidea is on the ventricles so it is basically it is on the roof of the third ventricle and see how the pia mater which is a fused structure divides against the roof to allow the tila choroidea and look at the red structure which is nothing but the choroid nucleus therefore you can see that the two layers of the pia mater they separate and this is present on the roof of the third ventricle so my dear students when you write or when you learn about tila choroidea remember it's a double layered pia mater which on the roof of the third ventricle separates anteriorly it tapers against the interventricular foramen posteriorly it remains as a gap which is labeled as transverse fissure it starts from the splenium of corpus callosum reaches up to the fornix and this is a very important structure because it has the content of the choroid plexus so now comes the choroid plexus what is this choroid plexus choroid plexus forms the cs this we all know so concentrate on the area which is red in color this is the choroid plexus so choroid you have the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle you have choroid plexus of third ventricle you will also look down below you will have choroid plexus of fourth ventricle so choroid plexus is a content of the ventricular system now this choroid plexus of third ventricle is basically formed by the medial and lateral posterior choroidal branches of posterior cerebral artery and of lateral ventricle it is anterior choroidal artery so this again comes as a mcq this diagram is not needed for you to practice but this diagram will enable you to understand how the choroid plexus which is present in the lateral ventricle also present in the third ventricle also present will be also present in the fourth ventricle therefore from the 
third ventricle to lateral ventricle. First, before we go on to the lateral ventricle, we have to identify certain structures. What is this structure? This whole structure is the corpus callosum. And this part is the genu of the corpus callosum. So for lateral ventricle, our story will begin from here. Then we have, what is this structure? We all know that this is nothing but the part of the lateral ventricle. Then we have the fornix. Then we have the thalamus here. And we also have this thin structure. We have the septum pellucida. So now we see that the lateral ventricle is a bigger chamber. See, in the diagram which is down, the lower diagram, the purple color is the lateral ventricle. You can see two lines of lateral ventricle. That is lateral ventricle on the right hand side, lateral ventricle on the left hand side. Where is it located? Against the corpus callosum. So from where to where it goes? It goes through the foramen of Mundo. It goes to the third ventricle. See the diagram above. It is connecting with the blue structure below. That is the foramen of Mundo. And the blue structure is the third ventricle. So you can see in comparison to third ventricle, lateral ventricle is a quite a huge structure. It is also lined by ependymal cells. Now see, the parts of lateral ventricle is basically the, it is separated again by the same diagram, midline structure which is known as septum pellucidum. It has four parts. The anterior horn follow the Right, rightmost diagram. So this is the anterior part which is actually anterior horn. This is in the frontal lobe. Then we have the central part of the body against the parietal lobe. I'm sure my students, you know that there are lobes in the cerebral hemisphere. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. So we have the lateral ventricle against each lobe. That is, we have the anterior against the frontal, the central part against the parietal lobe, the posterior horn is against the occipital lobe and the inferior is against the temporal. So all the lobes have a part of the lateral ventricle. This is very important. This concept is very important to revise again. Look at this diagram. So anterior horn is in the frontal, the blue one on the right side. The pink one is the central part, which is again in the parietal lobe. Then the yellow one is the posterior, which is in the occipital lobe. And the orange one is the inferior, which is in the temporal lobe. Now this triangular part, which has a part of the body, the posterior horn and the inferior horn, is known as the collateral trigo. And it is the widest part of the lateral ventricle. Now widest part enables actually better more circulation of CSF, and if there is an anomaly, there's a chance that overaccumulation can occur there. Therefore, the four lobes are more concerned with the four parts of the cerebral hemisphere, with the four parts of the lateral ventricle. Now, coming to the anterior horn. Now, this anterior horn is basically, it is present, this is light green part. 
so this part is the anterior horn it is present in the frontal lobe anterior horn is blind anterior posteriorly what is happening my dear students it is continuous with the body of the lateral ventricle now i before i proceed further i would ask you to remember that third ventricle lateral ventricle and fourth ventricle boundary are very important usually you get at least one question for the theoretical part and in oral also you are asked and in postgraduate entrance also you are asked so this is the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle which is blind anteriorly and posteriorly it is continuous with the central part of the body of the lateral ventricle it is in connection with the interventricular foramen of monro which takes it to the third ventricle so this is the third ventricle so where actually is third ventricle located look lateral ventricle is like a c shaped structure and in the curvature of the c is the third ventricle so it's a very easy concept so anterior junction between anterior horn and the central part of the body has the interventricular foramen so anterior horn communicates with the body posteriorly and with the interventricular foramen inferiorly so what are the boundaries anteriorly the anterior horn has the corpus callosum i started with the genu so it has the genu posteriorly it is continuous with the central part of the body the roof is formed by this is the roof the roof is formed by the body of corpus callosum look at the second diagram the body of corpus callosum floor has the head of caudate nucleus the topmost diagram the head of caudate nucleus and medially is the septum pellucidum let us re revise once again medial wall is by the septum pellucidum roof by the body of the corpus callosum floor by the head of caudate nucleus and it is anteriorly is the genu of the corpus callosum and this is blind anteriorly posteriorly continuous with the body inferiorly by the interventricular foramen of monro remember one thing there is a red star here on the slide what can you see here can you see the extent of the choroid plexus no anterior horn of lateral ventricle does not have telechoroidia and choroid plexus so this is a very very important mcq and question and a point to remember next slide so going to the central part or the body of the lateral ventricle so it is in relation to the parietal lobe i had said the anterior horn is frontal the body is parietal so from the foramen of mondo to the splenium of corpus callosum this whole olive green structure on the top diagram is nothing but the body of the lateral ventricle so anteriorly it communicates with the foramen of monro posteriorly with the splenium of the corpus callosum what is happening in the roof the roof has the trunk of the corpus callosum medial wall has the septum pellucidum floor has the thalamus as well as the caudate nucleus so caudate nucleus is lateral and the thalamus is medial what are the structures present between the caudate nucleus and thalamus the thalamus triad vein and striae terminalis this diagram students if you can practice 
will be helpful for your anterior horn as well as the central part. Now, choroid fissure, look at the blue structure below the septum pellucidum and the body of horning. So septum pellucidum on one side is attached to corpus callosum. On the other, it is attached to body of horning. Inferiorly, you get the choroid fissure, which contains the telachoroidia and the choroid plexus. So the central part has a roof, which has the trunk of corpus callosum. The medial wall is the septum pellucidum, extending from corpus callosum to body of cornix. Laterally, we have the caudate nucleus in the lateral part and the medial part, we have the thalamus. In between is the thalamus striat wing and the stria terminalis. If you see this such beautiful radiological view, because we when we have to see the ventricles, it's a very common condition because for any injury to the brain, for any hemorrhage, for any accumulation of CSF, ventricular system is a potential space where blood can get accumulated, pus can get accumulated, or CSF can get over accumulated. Therefore, we need to do CT MRI. And this is the picture, how it looks. So on the left hand side, you can see the corpus callosum and this butterfly shape is the lateral ventricle. And below, you can see the small third ventricle and the midbrain and the cerebral acuta. So let us concentrate on the butterfly shape. I will take you to the right side. On the right side, see how beautiful you can see the corpus callosum. You can see the septum pellucidum getting attached to the cornix. F stands for cornix. CN stands for caudic nucleus, which is lateral. And below we get the thalamus. In between, what did I tell? I said you get the striatominalis and the thalamus striate vein. Therefore, you can make out, you might have thought when I was teaching you that why madam is teaching in such detail that what is what are the structures between what it nucleus and thalamus? How does it matter to us? Yes, it matters. You can see how beautifully Radiologically, you can delineate the corpus callosum, the septum pellucidum, the cornix, the caudic nucleus. We have the thalamus here, and you can see if there was some anomaly, you could have seen this is a normal radiological picture. So CC stands for corpus callosum, SP stands for septum pellucidum, F stands for cornix and CN stands for caudate nucleus. Now let us go to the next part. So this is the posterior horn. Where is it located? I say posterior horn is located posteriorly against the occipital lobe. So it is in the body of the corpus callosum. And you go to the inferior diagram, the lower diagram, see, you can see that the there is a green structure above. Against it is a purple structure. Against this, there are some fibers and then the pink fibers. So these pink are the optic radiations. Now, what is happening on the inferomedial wall? Look at the cut section of the brain. So look at the inferomedial wall. On the inferomedial wall of the lateral ventricle, you can see that there are two bulges. Where are these bulges? The upper bulge is the bulb of posterior horn. So upper bulb, bulge is the bulb of posterior horn, which is due to the fibers of the forceps major. And lower is the calcaravis, which is due to the calcarine sulcus. That is invagination of the calcarine sulcus. And superolaterally, it is in relation to tapetum, which is the 
body of the corpus callosum running posteriorly is known as tapetum. So you can see that going to the again to the cut section on the inferior, the lower slide, the lateral ventricle has the tapetum on the outermost part. Then we have two bulgings. One is the bulb of the posterior horn, which is due to the forceps major and the calcaravis inferiorly, which is due to the calcarine sulcus. So this is the posterior horn. Coming to the inferior horn. Now inferior horn in the diagram above or in the diagram below, wherever you see it, if you are looking at the diagram below, it is the red structure, which is the inferior horn. Therefore, you can see that the inferior horn, it ends at the thalamus into the temporal lobe and is adjacent to the thalamus and the head of cordate nucleus, we have the attachment of the amygdaloid body. So, in, against the tail of cordate nucleus and the thalamus, we have the amygdaloid body. Head of cordate nucleus is against the body and the tail of cordate nucleus is against the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. So, we, I had already said in the diagram C, the anterior horn is blind, posteriorly connected to the body of the lateral ventricle. Body of lateral ventricle continues into the posterior horn as well as the inferior horn. In between the inferior horn, posterior horn and the body, we get the collateral triangle which is the widest area of the ventricular cavity. Therefore, if we take the boundaries of the inferior horn, we have a roof. The roof is formed by the striaterminalis, tail of cordic nucleus and the thalamus striate vein. The lateral part is the tapetum. This diagram we have already seen. Anterior end is related to the amygdaloid body, which is attached to the tail of cordic nucleus. The floor is related to hippocampus. So you can see the curvature of the hippocampus. Now the lateral part presents an elevation called the collateral eminence due to the collateral sulcus. So the inferior horn, if I take you to the earlier slide, it has a trigone. The trigone is related to the inferior horn, posterior horn and the body. It is the widest part of the ventricular cavity. It has the collateral sulcus with the collateral eminence related to the hippocampus. And this hippocampus, it has the, it is attached to the fimbria. Superiorly, it is related to the striaterminalis, the thalamus striate vein, and the tail of cordic nucleus, which has the amygdala body attached to it. And then we have the tapeta. Now, further. I would like to say that this hippocampus, see it is gray in color. Now this hippocampus is covered by a thin layer of white matter, which is called alveus. And this alveus actually, it is, the alveus is composed of the axons and it forms a ridge which is known as fimbria. Now, so, Medially, you get the fimbria and laterally, you get the collateral eminence. This collateral eminence is formed due to the collateral sulcus. So, laterally, collateral eminence, medially, fimbria, superiorly, striaterminally, still a cordate nucleus, amygdaloid body, and tepetum. 
these are the boundaries of the inferior horn. So you can easily understand because we have got a very important structure, the hippocampus here. Therefore, the inferior horn of lateral ventricle is a potential question. You have the fimbria here, you have the alveus here, you have the collateral eminence here, you have the collateral sulcus here, and therefore, and you also have the tepitum as the outermost boundary. That is why it is said that the most important part of the lateral ventricle is the inferior horn and as well as the central part or the body of the lateral ventricle. Now coming to the clinical anatomy, this is very important because after all we are finishing the ventricular system and we have to know the clinical anatomy that is why we had here. Now, I say that when there is overaccumulation of CSF, it gives rise to a condition known as hydrocephalus. Look at the picture of this girl. She has such a huge head. This is a condition of hydrocephalus. Now, this hydrocephalus can be due to blockage in the flow, that is, the interventricular foramen of Bondo is blocked, aqueduct of Silvius is blocked. Foramen of Lushka or Majendi, they are blocked. So it is called non communicating hydrocephalus, non communicating. So the individual foramina or the doors are closed. It cannot communicate. It can give rise to again accumulation of CSF. But if there is impaired absorption or overproduction, then it is called communicating hydrocephalus. It can be increased production but due to the choroid plexus tumor, which is producing. It can be blocked circulation, as I said, either interventricular foramen or aqueduct of sylvius or foramen of lushka, imagine D, anything can be blocked or it can be due to impaired absorption due to, say, some inflammatory exudate, inflammation, thrombosis, there can be impaired absorption. That means there is, ultimate is what? Accumulation of CSF. So one sentence makes it done. Over accumulation of CSF is hydrocephalus. This over accumulation can be due to increased production or can be due to impaired communication. Impaired communication can be blockage of any of these foramina. Increased production can be the choroid plexus and the in the telechoroidia giving rise to more CSF. Look at this radiological investigation of lateral ventricle. See how the planes have been defined. Which plane has been taken to take a picture of this. Now, these are normal pictures of the lateral ventricle. But if there is an anomaly, then dye is given to delineate the structure which has come into question. So a radio-opaque dye is given. But these are normal radiological view of the lateral ventricles. So it is actually, if there is a lesion on this side, then there will, it will be pushed to the opposite side. This condition is known as midline shifting. And the investigations which can be done are CT scan, MRI, this can be with the dyes, or it can be pneumoventriculography. Air is injected and the contour of the ventricles are noted. I thought I will just give you an overview of the CSF. I'm sure you must have done in the physiology. It is equally important in biochemistry because the CSF constituents are very important. It is equally and more important in anatomy. So CSF, we all know, it's in the subarachnoid space. And it extends into the ventricles of the brain up to central canal of the spinal cord. So choroid plexus secretes it at 
the rate of about 500 milliliters per day. It is reabsorbed by the granulations, arachnoid granulations. So we can say choroid secretes, arachnoid absorbs. So when there is hypo, uh, hydrocephalus, it can be something to do with the arachnoid. It can be something to do with the choroid. So I will not go into much detail because this is an area which you must have done. But my ventricular system topic will not be complete without doing CSF. So about total volume is 140 milliliter. And the pressure normally is 50 to 200 in supine and 200 to 250 in the seating position. This is important because it can give rise to intracranial tension. Now, the pathway is, you all know, this diagram is very important. Lateral ventricle to foramen of Monroe to third ventricle to aqueduct of Sylvius to fourth ventricle to foramen of Magindy and Lushka to subarachnoid spaces of the brain and spinal cord and the absorption into venous sinuses. Please practice CSF circulation pathway and practice CSF as a short book. What are the functions? Functions are it protects the brain from injury, it gives nutrition, removes waste products, we know. Now there is a condition called papilledema. The subarachnoid space extends back of retina. If there is increased CSF, there is a back pressure on the retinal vessels and resulting in congestion or bulging of the optic disc. It is done in detail when we do the eye work. Lumbar puncture is done for investigation or for decreasing the intracranial tension at the level of lumbar 3, 4 or 4, 5 vertebra. Now, this is done for sample examination or the estimation of CSF tension or radio opaque dye is given, chemotherapy for the carcinoma, anesthetic drugs for the spinal anesthesia, Normally, CSA pressure rises in sneezing, coughing, crying, standing. This is known as quickened state sign. Now, my dear students, when I taught you cerebellum, I taught you Romberg sign. When I am teaching you CSF, this is also important, the quickened state sign. Now, it is done between, you can see the diagrams, how it is done in the sitting position or in the lateral decubitus position. Now, the, there are certain contraindications. The One of them is when there is application of anticoagulants like warfarin war sodium or something, there is increased risk of epidural hematoma. There can be risk for the cellulitis or abscess at the lumbar puncture site. So quick and state sign is the, when it is positive in the block in the subarachnoid space and when the internal jugular vein pressure, there is compression in the neck and CVP rises, the absorption of CSF is inhibited. So this is important. The other indications are for the skull injury or for the direct contracoup injury, that is the brain is shifted to the opposite side, which is known as midline shifting, or the skull fracture, or there is hemorrhage in the brain tissue. So, thank you, my dear students. To summarize, I will say that you must have a fairly good knowledge of the ventricular system. So you should read the third ventricle, lateral ventricle, and fourth ventricle simultaneously, number one. Number two, read about the walls, the roof and floor of the third ventricle, and practice with a labeled diagram. Number three is interventricular foramen of Monroe communicates the lateral ventricle with the third ventricle. So the lateral ventricle parts are the anterior horn, central part, posterior horn, inferior horn with the collateral triangle. The anterior horn is blind anteriorly and other horns are intercommunicating. 
you have to see where is stila choroidea. Because stila choroidea is a triangular structure which is anteriorly projected towards the interventricular foramen and posteriorly there is transverse vision. There is a cap. Then we will take you, you must read in detail about the boundary of the central horn or the central part and the inferior horn. You have to understand the anatomy of the corpus callosum and the cornets to understand about the location of the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle and how the caudic nucleus, the head and tail of caudic nucleus and the thalamus are related to this structure. Since CSF is circulating inside, therefore you have to know what is stila choroidea, where is choroid flexures. If you remember the fourth ventricle, I had discussed about the flow, about the inferior aspect of the roof of the fourth ventricle, where I had shown you where the foramen of Magindi and the Lushka are located. So that was the choroid flexures. So how these choroid flexures is important? The most important statement is anterior horn of lateral ventricle. Neither has stila choroidea, nor does it have choroid flexures. The last part is how it looks radiologically is important because you will be given as a, probably a uh, plate of the lateral showing lateral ventricle, corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, four leaves, as I have shown you. And lastly, the Quackenstedt sign, the CSF circulation, and the hydrocephalus. You cannot miss. These are the must-know areas for this topic. Parter, I have already posted probable MCQs and short answer questions, which I expect my students will practice and excel in anatomy. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank for you, the sir. wonderful session, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's wait for a while for uh, any queries from the viewers, ma'am. Okay, sir. Yes, ma'am. Dear viewers, you can post your queries on your uh, on our uh, YouTube chat section. Meanwhile, you can post your uh, feedbacks, valuable feed, valuable feedback on this session also here in the link uh, given in the chat section. Dear students, uh, meanwhile, you can uh, like and share our uh, YouTube channel www.tinyurl.com slash Indian Medical College 2020. You can like and share our Facebook page www.fb.com slash Indian Medical College 2020. There you can access the recorded videos and MCQs and uh, announcements of all the upcoming sessions. The MCQ for uh, today's session uh, handled by Madam will also be uploaded uh, tonight and you can uh, make utilize of it. Here is the upcoming session today at 5, 5 to 6 p.m. Shock and sepsis uh, by Dr. Joseph and uh, by 6.30 to between 6.30 to 7.30, uh, Dr. Gopalan presenting surgical anatomy of Thang. And this is the schedule for tomorrow. Where Dr. Geeta handling uh, blood supply to brain and basal ganglia, and Dr. Srikant handling on nephrotics and uh, nephrotic syndromes. Dr. Rajit Kumar Kelani in the session three handling uh, interpretation of pure tone audiogram and impedance audiometry. Thank you, sir. All the best, my dear. Thank students. you, ma'am. Thank you so yes, much for the you. informative session, ma'am. Thank we you. We will wind up the session here. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, dear all.